So um, just as everyone else um, joins, I'd like to thank everyone for coming along today, today's topics on Amazon Workspaces and AWS Client VPN, and then diving into FSX for file share on Windows EC2. As always, we'd love your feedback. Um, so if you've got any topics that you wanna hear about, any ideas or just any comments in general, uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen um, or you can just paste the link into the, the URL. If you have any presentation ideas as well, um, we'd love to hear them. So email us at hello plus meetup at polar7.com uh, and we can have a chat about potentially getting you up in front of the group. Uh, so the agenda for today's meeting is diving into the Amazon Workspaces and Client VPN. So we have Lee Lachlan here joining us today. I'll get him to, to introduce himself shortly. Uh, and then diving into FSX for file share on Windows EC2 with Raj. Um, so I'll get again him to, to introduce himself shortly. Um, at the end, we'll be going through some AWS quiz questions uh, to test your knowledge, something that we tried the, the last time. And if the poll system doesn't work this time, um, I'll just record the results myself. So I'll throw it over to you, Lee. Um, thanks a lot. Yeah, cool. One moment, just share screen. Okay, Jackson, can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. That's great. Uh, hi everyone, it's Lee Lachlan. I'm a senior consultant at Polar7. Um, and uh, today I wanted to talk about two uh, services uh, that have been around for quite a while uh, from AWS. Uh, they're particularly relevant at this point in time uh, where you know a lot of workplaces are in a remote first uh, world at the moment with the uh, upsurge again uh, with COVID. Um, so you know some of the services that are offered by uh, AWS really uh, sort of enable that uh, remote first uh, world that we find ourselves in again. And uh, so it's probably probably a good time to uh, have, a, have another look at workspaces and uh, client VPN. There's a couple of other services such as AppStream and a, and a few others that really enable uh, remote working. But today uh, we just wanted to focus briefly on, on these two. Um, so I'm sure many of you have heard uh, about workspaces over the years. It's um, so uh, like a, a quick overview. So it's a for those that don't know, it's a fully managed, uh, persistent uh, virtualization service for for desktops. Um, it replaces uh, traditional uh, VDI solutions. Um, if any of you have um, had to build or manage those in the past, uh, uh, you can appreciate the complexity behind uh, Microsoft or or Citrix uh, VDI solutions. So I mean, the, the key thing with workspaces is that it's fully managed and scales up and lives, uh, you know, in a dedicated VPC in your account. So um, Linux support, I think, was added about uh, two years ago. But uh, so so Windows and Linux desktops are, um, are available in, in just a few minutes. And you can quickly scale up to uh, thousands of, of desktops for, for workers around the globe. Uh, one of the cool things is, is that it, it gives a secure and consistent uh, desktop experience to all users, regardless of the, the device that they're, uh, they're coming in on. So they could be joining um, using a tablet or a regular PC or a Mac or any other applicable device where, uh, where they need a consistent workspace. Uh, the really cool thing about it is um, the, uh, the, the security of, of user data never leaves the data center. So uh, you can really uh, focus on retaining that security in the cloud and just have uh, a workspace uh, presented to, to the user no matter where they are, as long as they've got a good uh, internet connection. So there's four, four common use cases that are, uh, that are uh, really uh, tabled regularly for, for workspaces. 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, remote work. So having that um, consistent and persistent uh, desktop experience, uh, no matter where you are or whatever device you're, you're coming in on is, is key. Uh, things like contact centers, uh, they've really had to evolve over the last couple of years with, with COVID. So, um, you know, large contact centers that typically hosted hundreds of, of people uh, aren't really a possibility in many locales at the moment. So having a contact center folk uh, working from their homes uh, is a very real possibility uh, with streaming uh, video and audio, et cetera, and uh, being able to access that workspace from anywhere, as long as there's a good internet connection, has uh, been key to enabling a lot of contact centers globally. Uh, similar for contingent workforces. So where uh, there may be a large uh, contract uh, workforce to enable certain um, types of um, outcomes for organizations. So it may be a large uh, charity organization or maybe large health um, worker organization that needs to quickly onboard uh, hundreds or even thousands of users in some cases. That's a very good uh, use case for, for workspaces. Uh, and one of the more traditional ones is uh, mergers and acquisitions. So the ability to quickly uh, bring uh, users across and uh, provision a workspace for them when they may have a physical device that was issued by a different organization, they can quickly uh, transition between the two environments. Um, so they have a notion of uh, bundles. So uh, you can have um, different um, profiles. So CPU, memory, storage, come in different profiles and uh, with different hardware and software bundles. So for example, you can have uh, Microsoft Office, Trend Micro and a, a few other uh, applications, um, I think for about an additional 15 US dollars a month. Uh, we'll, we'll have a look at some of the different profiles that are available. But um, we have the notion of value, standard performance, Power, Power Pro, and some of the GPU enabled uh, workspaces that are available. So there's really something there for every uh, every type of uh, worker category. So right up to power user, uh, GPU enabled, right down to uh, simple. You know, uh, uh, some workers may simply require a browser that is appropriately permissioned and has access to perhaps certain uh, data center or uh, on-prem resources that are available through through the workspace. Uh, so just to give you a bit of an idea of some of the bundles that are available, you can see how right at the bottom end of the spectrum, you have a, that simple uh, low memory configuration right up to standard performance, Power, Power Pro, and the GPU enabled uh, workspaces that are available. Uh, the utilities software bundle um, mainly uh, incorporates some browser, different browser options, but um, there are those. So Microsoft uh, Office, for example, is a common uh, bundled software. So this means that you, know, you can provision these workspaces, ramp up to thousands of workspaces. You may only need them for a couple of weeks. You can have Microsoft Office uh, licensed for the time that it's required and then uh, tear it all down uh, a couple of weeks later. So. The, uh, yeah, the, the workspaces evolve to your needs and you're only paying for what you use, consistent with all, all uh, AWS services. So some of the management and security features that are available, uh, through the console, you can configure um, certain client types or you can enforce that uh, web only clients are able to access uh, workspaces. Uh, the uh, PC over IP remote display protocol is uh, used by workspaces. This ensures that you can achieve those outcomes uh, by, um, by um, securing all of the um, browser activity, for example, in the workspace to go out through a particular proxy as, as may suit with appropriate filtering or uh, you can reach uh, on-premises resources via Direct Connect or site-to-site -site VPN. So from the VPC that the workspaces live in, you can uh, eventually jump back uh, to on-prem through your uh, existing connectivity. 
so yeah, you can filter on IP addresses and a few other uh, filtering options. You can use digital certificates, uh, so it can be made very, very secure. Um, and of course, given the protocol is uh, encrypted um, to and from the cloud, the storage volumes can be encrypted so you can meet a whole lot of compliance um, uh, requirements using uh, both in transit and at rest encryption. So yeah, it's uh, very, very useful. Uh, in terms of directory integration, obviously uh, being able to integrate with directories makes this incredibly useful. So being able to um, integrate with uh, existing directories means that you're not having to provision separate uh, user lists, et cetera, to, um, to, to enable these workspaces. So users can then log in with their existing uh, corporate credentials from uh, an on-prem directory. Um, there's a couple of options there for achieving uh, directory sync uh, between the two environments, either hosting AD or uh, connecting to it. High level architecture. So you can see uh, over on the left, the users um, access uh, their workspace via the internet. They uh, then access the, the, uh, both the auth and session gateway and the streaming gateway within the, um, within the AWS cloud using the, the public uh, endpoints that are exposed for the service. Uh, they, uh, the workspaces then live in a dedicated VPC in the AWS cloud. And uh, you can see just in the bottom of the diagram on the right there, you can have your AD connection and you do over onto the left, your on-premises connectivity can be achieved by site-to-site -site VPN or direct connect. So this brings uh, the users uh, much closer to workloads that are already running in AWS if, uh, if you have that already. And um, so you can reduce latency just depending on the geographies involved and the configurations uh, that you've implemented in AWS. So this is a great way of keeping everything in the cloud and ensuring only uh, view only essentially access to those uh, workspaces enabled um, from uh, the user perspective. So there's a couple of additional features uh, these have been requested over the years and are particularly useful. So, um, for example, bringing your own licenses, you can do that, which brings down the, the cost of uh, the workspace. Uh, there's Application Manager or WAM that's uh, a secure way to deploy and manage applications for users. So you can set various profiles and, and so forth to um, so certain users in certain groups. Uh, get certain applications, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so what else do we have? So CloudWatch metrics are uh, integrated as well. So you can check uh, health and connection metrics. You can uh, upsize a uh, user if you find they're um, continually hitting various boundaries in that uh, workspace configuration. Pricing options, you can pay either by the hour or by the month. So there is a baseline amount. Uh, so if you choose to consume by the hour, you pay a base fee and then uh, just for the usage um, by the hour, or you can pay a fixed monthly fee to um, have instant access to a persistent workspace at all times. So the user state is uh, saved in the case that uh, a disconnect is made and not accessed for, for several hours. Uh, the session can be recovered uh, later on with a subsequent login. Uh, just to give you a, a bit of an example as to Linux pricing. So I've just focused on to, uh, to uh, the performance and the Power Pro just to give you a view of, of monthly pricing. This is in USD, obviously. Uh, so you can see you can pay a fixed monthly price or if you want to go for something at the top end of town, um, you can talking around, let's say 150 a month, just depending on how much uh, user volume storage is required. But you can see that if you only need it for maybe a day a month or two days a month, you can pay that flat fee uh, to ensure there's uh, allocation there for you and then an hourly fee. So it's very, very flexible. Um, just moving on to Windows pricing. So I'll just switch between the two you can see there's a slight uplift in uh, licensing pricing, just depending on uh, whether you're consuming a Windows license or not as part of the configuration. 
So yeah, that is workspaces. Um, I'm just uh, conscious of time as well. So it's 1.16, I might just uh, park uh, questions for the moment. I just wanted to quickly move on to client VPN. So this is another great enabler for remote first uh, world. Uh, client VPN is a, um, it's basically a scalable uh, managed client VPN service. So if you think in the past, having to manage uh, VPN appliances and concentrators and so forth, and uh, manage that either on-prem or in a data center is very, very costly and uh, time consuming. So this is a managed service from AWS. It can scale up very, very quickly and does so automatically, uh, just depending on um, what uh, number of users you require. So just briefly, the steps undertaken by the administrator, it's as simply as creating a client VPN endpoint and associating the uh, various assets in AWS, like the target network, authorization rules, and additional routes if required, particularly if you want to get back to on-prem via your site to site VPN or direct connect. Uh, so after it's set up and configured, uh, you can um, download the endpoint configuration file and make that available to users. And that includes the DNS name and the client VPN endpoint, et cetera. So it makes it very, very easy for the uh, user to, to access. So once that service is configured, uh, the end user simply um, establishes the VPN connection using that uh, configuration file, um, OpenVPN uh, standard, and they can see once they've made the connection, they can securely access the resources in the VPC um, to, to where the connection is being made to, and they can also depending on the configuration in AWS, you can reach uh, other resources or uh, again, going back on-prem, uh, just depending on what's required. So this, this really enables that possibility to, um, uh, to, to um, scale up big and use the AWS cloud as a way of scaling that um, VPN connectivity requirement, even if you're uh, accessing on-prem resources. Uh, so quick uh, architecture diagram, you can see it's quite simple. Uh, the client VPN endpoint uh, attaches to, uh, to the VPC subnet. From there, you can use a virtual gateway to reach uh, the on-premises network. And uh, you can, this is a very simplified uh, diagram, but you can of course uh, go back out to uh, the internet using the secure, uh, whether you're using a proxy or any sort of filtering in the cloud you can uh, go out uh, securely that way and access other AWS services. And you can also jump uh, across to other VPCs as well. Uh, just briefly, uh, pricing. So you pay an endpoint association fee per hour and an active connection fee. So the most you'd pay per user is uh, 20 cents an hour. And uh, billing is prorated, of course, uh, for the hour in question. So uh, you're only paying for what you use. But you do need to essentially provision capacity uh, or specify the number of users to calculate the endpoint association uh, volume. So I'm just moving on to questions now. I see there's a, let me just jump in. Uh, yeah, and growth, if you, uh, the VPC structure, the workspaces sits on two VPCs, one custom or one AWS managed. Yeah, so um, it, it uh, requires a dedicated VPC. The, the beauty of that is you get to specify the subnet structures and uh, therefore you can determine the AZ placement of uh, resources as you require. But uh, yeah, so you can, uh, you can be quite flexible in uh, determining your, uh, your VPC layout. Um, no open questions. Thanks for the question, Jan. Appreciate that. And to that, I'll move on to um, the next slide. So uh, if you require any uh, further information, uh, Polar 7 have developed a lot of automation, uh, particularly for workspaces and client VPN deployments. So we're able to uh, deploy this rapidly for organizations that require that quick uh, ramp up. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us if we can uh, assist. 
and uh, there's a QR code to scan uh, for further information on uh, remote working. So we'd love to, uh, any further questions you have, even after the meetup, of course, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, so that I will hand over to uh, Raj. Raj, feel free to take over the sharing. Thanks, Thanks Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jackson, are you able to see my screen? Yes, I can see that. Cool, yeah. thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rajiv Rochin. I work as a cloud engineer with uh, Polar 7 in the consulting team. I help my clients um, build, migrate, and modernize their applications and workloads on the AWS cloud. Uh, today, I want to talk about FSx for file share on Windows EC2 with mapping. Uh, some introduction to FSx for Windows File Server. FSx provides a fully managed Microsoft Windows File Server backed by a fully native Windows file system. Uh, it supports the industry standard server message block protocol to access the file storage over a network. FSx uh, is a managed uh, file system, so it eliminates the need to set it up and provision the file servers and storage volumes and uh, the updates and hardware failures and backups are taken care in the backend by AWS. Um, FSx uh, file storage is accessible from Windows, Linux, and Mac OS compute instances. And also devices running on uh, AWS, uh, such as EC2 and AppStream and workspaces and the VMI cloud on AWS can uh, access FSx file storage. Network connectivity to the FSx uh, file system uh, is through uh, in VPC access, VPN, uh, direct connect, VPC peering, or through transit gateway. Some of the core concepts of uh, FSx for Windows file server is file system, file server backups, and file shares. File system is, as you know, where you store the uh, store your files which you want to access, and um, where there's uh, one or more Windows file servers and storage volumes in a file system. Storage capacity and throughput capacity uh, can be defined when you create a file system. Backups with FSx is consistent and highly durable and incremental. It uses a volume shadow copy service in Microsoft Windows and automatic daily backups are turned on by default. Uh, file shares uh, is another concept wherein um, FSx comes with a, a default Windows file share when it is deployed uh, with, a, with a slash share is the default share. Uh, it's basically nothing but a specific folder which is created when the file system is uh, deployed. Uh, FSx itself can be accessed uh, through a DNS name or you can create a DNS alias in root 53. Some of the native Windows compatibility features for FSx include uh, support for NTFS, uh, it supports uh, native SMB 2.0 to 3.1.1. Uh, it supports DFS namespaces. With DFS namespace, uh, you can group your file shares uh, from different file systems onto a single namespace and uh, present that to your clients. Uh, in the uh, image, you can see that there are different file FSx file servers deployed and the uh, file share against each of them. And there is a common namespace example.com slash cop, which is presented as a single file set to the clients. FSx also integrates with Microsoft AD and supports uh, Windows ACL. It provides a uh, fast and flexible performance. It's built on uh, SSD storage and provides uh, high throughput in IOPS. FSx file system, you can be, uh, you can deploy that uh, in basically two modes, there are two options, as a single lazy or a multi-AZ. Um, on the image, you can see that it's deployed as a, a multi-AZ architecture uh, with the connectivity to on-premise network using Direct Connect or VPN. When you deploy FSx in a single lazy mode, uh, it continually monitors and addresses hardware failures. It also replicates data within the AZ, uh, but when you deploy it in a multi-AZ, apart from monitoring continuously and replicating data within AC, it also repl replicates data across ACs and uh, automatically fails over if there is a 
uh, AZ or a, a pulse over failure. Uh, replication is continuous and it's synchronous uh, when you deploy that in a multi-AZ fault system. FSx supports uh, SQL Server HA deployments. Amazon FSx is uh, optimized uh, for shared storage uh, for X SQL Server database, databases by supporting continuously available shares. Uh, it uses uh, databases and logs for SQL Server always on FCI deployments. Uh, some of the events which trigger a multi-AZ failover is if the AZ itself fails or if the file server fails, uh, the AZ failover is triggered and uh, the file server in one AZ will automatically fail over to the other file server in another AZ. And uh, this happens in the background and there is a DNS switch which happens. FSx also supports a file level restore for end users, uh, shadow copies basically. So if you want to restore a specific file, which can be done uh, through uh, the previous versions tab, as you can see on the image, and uh, you no need to restore the entire file system. Uh, it's basically self-service and uh, you can compare previous file versions as well. Uh, it provides high performance, uh, less than one millisecond latencies and multiple gigabits of uh, throughput and thousands of IOPS. Throughput capacity is one factor which determines speed at which the file server hosting your file system can serve the file data. So FSx offers high levels of throughput, um, but also comes with higher levels of IOPS and more memory for caching of data. So throughput capacity can start uh, anywhere from 8 Mbps, which can be deployed on FSx and go, it can set up to two gigabits per second. And burst throughput can start anywhere from 192 Mbps per second to 438 Mbps per second. FSx offers sub millisecond latencies with, uh, with the SSD storage. Uh, you can get up to three gigabit per second of throughput and hundreds of thousands of IOPS for file system when you try to access uh, FSx directly, the file server. And uh, you can get up to 10 plus gigabits per second of throughput and millions of IOPS when you use client-side caching. Uh, as I said earlier, throughput capacity uh, can be set uh, by yourself or it can, uh, it, it, when you deploy an FSx file system, it's automatically recommended by FSx itself, as you can see on the screen but there is an option to also specify the throughput capacity. You can set a minim, the minimum storage capacity to be set as 32 gig and can go up to six double five three six GB byte per second, GB byte. Online throughput and storage capacity scaling. So FSx supports online storage and uh, capacity scaling. Uh, there are two options available on the image. As you can see, you can update the storage capacity and um, throughput capacity. You can define it as a percentage or an absolute value. Percentage, it should be in increments of at uh, 10%. And throughput capacity can be uh, um, changed online as well. Uh, some of the storage pricing per gig, GB per month for FSx is uh, for a single lazy for SSD based storage, you have to pay uh, for a Sydney region, it's 0.156 cents. And for multi-AZ, it's 0.276 cents. Uh, FSx supports data deduplication. So for large data sets, we often have a lot of duplicated data, which basically increase uh, storage costs. So um, uh, we want to reduce that cost. So FSx supports data dedupe. Once it is enabled, you save up to 50 to 60% of your costs. Um, once data dedupe is enabled, you can see the uh, uh, the pricing is uh, halved and uh, for SSD based storage uh, for a single AZ it's 0 0.078 cents and uh, multi AZ it's 0 0.138 cents. FSx uh, integrates directly with your organization's active directory, uh, whether it is on premise or in cloud. Uh, users can continue to access file shares by authenticating with the existing credentials, active directory credentials or they can migrate and uh, use uh, their existing, uh, you can migrate and use the existing files and folder ACLs uh, and share level access control. And how do we migrate is uh, 
using Windows native tools like Robocopy, and uh, it will still preserve the existing ACLs, but you can also know uh, FSX supports AWS data syncs to migrate uh, data for, from on-premise to FSX. Uh, FSX. Um, some of the AD integration options, which is supported this uh, AWS managed Microsoft AD and self-managed Microsoft AD, which is uh, deployed on-premise. Uh, how do we administer uh, FSX file system once it's deployed? So um, administering F FSX file system can be done using remote PowerShell and some of the features which can be configured, uh, SMB file shares, uh, shadow copies, data deduplication, user quotas and open session files. And you can also encrypt uh, uh, in transit and can enforce that. Um, the image uh, illustrates a uh, Windows PowerShell uh, command, which is uh, run to connect to the FSX using a remote uh, PowerShell uh, endpoint. It, uh, it is good to note that remote PowerShell endpoint is uh, different from the DNS endpoint of FSX itself. So you can see uh, there is uh, some get commands, which is run to get SMB shares, sessions and share access. FSX also integrates with different AWS services such as IAM, KMS, uh, CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and Workspaces. Uh, how do we enable FSX? It can be enabled from multiple ways uh, through either console or API or CloudFormation. And there are some links there to uh, deploy FSX and automate it through using CloudFormation templates. Um, the image there uh, depicts uh, uh, or illustrates uh, the creation of FSX through console. As you can see, uh, when you create a, a FSX file system for Windows file server, you have to define your Windows uh, file system name and the deployment type has to be chosen, whether multi AG or single AG. Storage capacity needs to be defined. Throughput capacity is automatically um, chosen as a recommended throughput capacity, but you can also specify the throughput capacity. Windows authentication needs to be chosen and uh, that can be a managed Microsoft AD or a self-managed AD on-premise. Uh, again, talking about enabling FSX for Windows file server, uh, it can be deployed uh, uh, or automated using CloudFormation. So the extract on the image on the right is, uh, is a, uh, CloudFormation resource type, AWS FSx file system, which is uh, deployed through CloudFormation template and uh, some of the parameters uh, which is passed. You can parameterize uh, uh, many of the properties. Uh, so one such uh, is Active Directory ID, as you can see there, and uh, also storage capacity. Once it's deployed, how do we manage FSx? So it needs to be managed through a management service console. So you'll have to just run fsmgnt.msc and it, it will open up a screen like that on, on your left. You can see all the shared folders there. And you can see there is a default uh, shared folder called share where you can store all your shared files once you're migrated from on-premise. But you can also uh, create additional shares and create additional folders. You can also see sessions and open files uh, within the within the um, management service console. Uh, how do we map FSx on EC2 instances? Uh, you can map uh, FSx file share on EC2 Windows instances by using a Windows uh, file explorer. As you can see on the image on the right, uh, uh, it's mapped as an UNC path uh, with the DNS name of the FSx file server and the share name, which is share, it's a default share. But you can also um, map it as a um, command prompt. Through command prompt, you can use NetUse with a persistent flag. Um, you can mount an FSX uh, for Windows file server file share on EC2 Linux as well. If that EC2 instance is either a domain join or not domain join, but uh, FSX file shares can be mapped to it. In order to do so, we'll have to install uh, SIFS URLs. You have to create the mount point directory and authenticate with Kerberos and mount file share. And the last uh, point is uh, the is the, just the command which is run sudo mount to mount the SIFS uh, uh, the the share mount the uh, share uh, point, mount the uh, uh, SIFS share to the um, to the Linux instance. 
uh, and the image on the left is uh, the VPC uh, screen. Uh, basically, it uh, illustrates the DNS name and the uh, IP address of the FSX file server and the remote partial endpoint. As you can see, there are uh, the DNS name and the remote partial endpoint is different. Although it looks similar, uh, it's, it's a different endpoint. Some conclusions on FSX file server on Windows. FSX has helped our clients uh, able to provision storage to each of their applications independently at scale and store shared files for the data management system. AWS FSX for Windows file system has also allowed our clients to connect from Amazon workspaces, which provided them a smooth uh, transition from on-premise to AWS cloud with fast, secure shared storage to company files. And AWS FSX has also assisted uh, clients to have a highly available, high, high performance Windows file system, which has reduced their maintenance and management costs while integrating seamlessly with their existing systems. Any questions on FSX uh, for file share on Windows? Uh, please feel free. Um, Great, thanks a lot for that, Raj. Um, so if, if anyone has any questions over the next um, five minutes, please feel free to, to shout out um, through either the chat feature or the Q&A. Um, and thanks as well to, to Lee for your presentation before on, on workspaces and, and client VPN. Um, seems like FSX could, could definitely work with a, a workspace set up there. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. All of these uh, technologies really enable, um, you know, organisations of all sizes to uh, to do what's needed in the times where so many are working uh, remotely. Definitely, yeah. Great. Um, so I'll just jump into um, just a few quick polls, uh, which are going to be aligned on questions that we've taken from. Um, both the well-architected review framework from some of the uh, Amazon certification exams and just our own experience. Um, again, as I mentioned at the start, if you're not able to answer them, um, don't feel um, yeah, that there's any, this will be co covering all different, um, both levels of knowledge and experience. So if you're not able to answer any questions, don't, don't take that personally. Um, so we'll go through one at a time. Uh, if you do jump ahead, that, that's fine. So the first one is what native business intelligence tool is used for data visualization and graphing? Um, so first option being Trusted Advisor, AWS Athena, um, AWS QuickSight, AWS Glue, or CloudWatch dashboards. So I'll just give it another 10 seconds. Uh, great, number two. So which AWS service is best suited for migrating 100 terabytes of data from on-premise to AWS in the same region? So AWS Glacier, AWS Snowball Edge, AWS Database Migration Service, or DataSync? Oh, sorry, the last one, Transfer Acceleration as well. It's another option. Again, I'll give that another 10 seconds. Uh, so number three, if you want the instance to run on a single tenant hardware, uh, which value do you need to set the instance tenancy attribute to? Uh, dedicated, isolated, single tenant or reserved? I'll just do a quick check, Lee. These um, questions are showing up on the screen, are they? They are indeed, yeah. I, uh, though it says the host and panelists can't vote, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I do have visual only. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I can see them as well. Yeah. If the response isn't getting counted, just take a, a visual representation um, and we'll, we'll go through um, what the answers are. Uh, 
so when will you incur costs with an elastic IP address? Um, so first option when it's allocated, uh, when it's allocated and associated with a running instance, or when it's allocated and associated with a stopped instance, or cost are uh, incurred regardless of whether it's associated with a, a running instance. Again, that's looking at the elastic IP address. Great, so we'll move on to number five. So if, if you're running your DB instance as a multi-AZ deployment, can you use the standby DB for read or write operations along with the primary database instance? So yes, only with MSQL RDS or only for Oracle RDS or fourth answer is no. We'll give that another 10 seconds. Uh, so number six, you have a content management system running on an EC2 instance, uh, which is approaching 100% CPU utilization. Uh, so which option will reduce the load on the Amazon EC2 instance? Um, so the options available would be to create a load balancer and register the, the Amazon EC2 instance with it, um, create a CloudFront distribution and configure the um, Amazon instance as the origin, create an auto scaling group um, using the um, create auto scaling action, or create a launch configuration using the launch configuration action. Great, and last but not least, so what are life cycle hooks used for in scaling? Uh, so first option, they're used to do health checks on instances. Second option, used to put an additional wait time to scale in or scale out events. Uh, third being used to shorten the wait time to scale in or scale out events, and the fourth being none of these. Great, so we'll just quickly go through um, the results of, of what everyone voted on. So Amazon QuickSight is the, the data visualization and graphing tool, which most people got correct. Um, Snowball Edge is uh, the best suited for a fast migration of, of large amounts of data. Um, I think they come in, in up to 50 terabyte uh, blocks there. Uh, number three, um, so everyone got that correct, dedicated instance. Um, the elastic IP will incur a cost uh, only when it's allocated and associated with a stocked instance. And so again, the majority got that right, which is good. Um, running um, the database as a multi-AZ deployment, you cannot have um, a, any read or write operations happen, happening on the, the secondary or failover. So that most people got that correct as well. Um, so 50-50 split here um, out of the people who who have who have answered it and i'm not sure if it, it would create uproar but the the correct response that we, we did have was um, to create a load balancer uh, to distribute the load um, but again if you guys would like to contest that would uh, love to hear any feedback in the comment section as to why you picked those two And lastly, so what are life cycle hooks used for in auto scaling? Again, majority got correct, um, using to put additional wait times to scale in or scale out events. Uh, so thanks thanks everyone for coming along today again we'd would love your feedback um, please scan the qr code and um, provide any topics or uh, presentation ideas for us to look at and um, we'll be 
uh, I think catching up in the next two months. So we'll be reaching out shortly with any updates to the um, to the meetup platform.